Time flies, but memories are forever. Hello, today I want to share with you some of my most recent memories in my journey to Cali, Colombia. Similar with my video about San Andres, the footage is messy. Some things are horizontal, some things are vertical, photos, yeah. In the same way, I did not pre-plan this, but I still want to share with you. Unlike San Andres, though, this time around, the journey was a little bit different. Cali is a city that I've been before. I basically grew up there. That's where half of my family comes from. And because of that, my journey wasn't exactly touristic. I did was able to visit some beautiful places that are quite touristic. But most of it was family time and playing Romiki, which is kind of the family game. So considering all of that, I decided that I was going to still talk about the beautiful city, but I'm going to do it a little bit different. In particularly one of the things that I want to point out besides the touristic areas and a little bit about where you could visit and places that are nice, I want to talk about a little bit more about the culture. I want to focus about some aspects that often not you don't realize are part of a culture until you move out. Some of these are very Colombian traits. But as with anything, culture comes from history. So let's begin with that. Now the full name is Santiago de Cali. It is the capital city of the department of Valle del Cauca. Valle means valley, and Cauca refers to the river Cauca that goes through it. This is part of the Pacific region. Cali is positioned in a particular place because it both touches the Andes but also has a direct route to the Pacific. This area is known because of the archaeological findings. One of the biggest indigenous groups from this area were known as Calima. That's where the name comes from. These groups had also connections with the groups that came from Mesoamerica and the Caribbean. When the Spanish started the whole journey, you know, to conquest, they actually began at Quito in Ecuador. They killed everyone there, and because they had the famous story of El Dorado, they decided to go up north. On the way up, they also founded a few cities, one of which was Popayán. In the map, you can actually notice that if you go a little bit more to the east and go over the Andes, you reach Cundinamarca, which is where El Dorado lies. If you go a little bit more up north, however, you reach Valle del Cauca. Before reaching Cali, though, they actually found the Cacique Jamundi. Cacique meaning Lija. And then you can also refer to the people that had that Lija as their name, so the people of Jamundi. They were destroyed, but they had a lot of gold, which was an incentive to the Spanish. Jamundi then actually became the name of a town that you can still visit. This is also an important zone because it touches a river that comes all the way from the Andes, which is known as the River Panse. However, then they found the Cacique Petecui, who alongside other tribes had got together in order to attack the Spanish. Sadly, they all lost, and that's how the Spanish conquered that area. As with many other parts of Latin America, the indigenous groups were killed, either murdered during the battles, or they were destroyed by the diseases that the Spanish and Europeans in general had brought. And also many of them died because of the hard labor. So in 1520, they decided to bring slaves all the way from Africa. And this is where the whole mestizaje began, which means the mixing of races. It's important to remember that this is not just a term that refers to physical or genetic aspects, but also cultural. In 1536, they founded the city of Santiago de Cali. Cali, coming from Calima. This actually makes the city over 450 years old. It is one of the oldest cities. Now, originally the city was actually placed a little bit more up north. It was later moved a little bit down and they had a whole service. And in that place, when they had a service, in 1678, they built a chapel, known quite ironically as La Merced. This chapel then became a coven and became a church and is now even a museum that you can visit. It is placed sort of at the center of the city, and this is an area that around has a lot of things where tourism is quite famous. At the time, however, this area was mainly used in order for trade stuff. You have some of the classical houses that belong to the Spanish, some of which are still up today, but most was not exactly a city as well as a lot of states. States were known as haciendas. This is where they mainly would produce sugar cane. And all of these estates usually had a name that later became the neighborhoods. Of course, Cali still has a lot of production of sugarcane, but it's mainly at the outskirts of the city. Then, of course, you have Nueva Granada, Gran Colombia, blah, blah, blah. Tiny thing, though, in 1810, there was a constitution of Cartagena, which abolished slavery. However, the government really didn't do anything until the 1850s. 
But as with many other things, just because something has been officially abolished doesn't mean it's still not going on, especially the ideologies and mentality behind that whole issue, which is still a big part of where a lot of Colombian culture comes from. So what happened was that when the slaves arrived, they would be separated. The idea was that even though they could come from the same place in Africa, they couldn't stay together, so it would be dissipated. Once they were free, there was this word called cimarron. This referred to an animal that was once domesticated, went out and became wild. This is how they would call free slaves. And all of them would usually go to the zone of the Pacific region. Now, of course, one can base a lot of reasons exactly of why they went there. But it was a combination of factors, including that it was slightly easier to go there than to go to the Amazons. And also they would connect with the Caribbean, where many other slaves have arrived to. So a lot of them congregated in this area and they created houses and a community. This was known as Palenques. And all of this comes together because, once again, this is culture, a culture that they had beforehand and now they were building something in a new territory with other people. And all of this leads to the beautiful and amazing Colombian culture that we love. I think sometimes people forget that a lot of slaves were brought was because they could also resist the weather. If you actually think about it, many of the cities where the most colonizers, especially European colonizers, established themselves were cities where it was not that hot. Not that they were in, in those cities, but most of them, like the big groups, would go to those places. Cali has a weather that is tropical climate with dry summers. We don't have seasons, but we have like two seasons that we call basically dry and wet. Either it rains a lot or it doesn't rain. These are aspects that are shown also in the everyday culture, as well as architecture. Most buildings and places have a pool, and there's a lot of sports centers that you can visit, especially during the hot, hot days. Another thing that you would do to combat the hot weather would be to visit the River Panse. That is kind of a whole day, and it is quite typical. You would prepare a lot of food at home and you would bring everything with you and you would spend the day there. It was usually a very nice day, quite fun. The weather, of course, also influences the school. They start at September, while, for example, at Bogotá, where it is mainly cold, we start at, like, January, February. So I remember whenever we would go during the summer holidays, I would always have to wait for my cousins to finish school to actually, you know, hang out with them. On that note, how do you arrive to the city? One classical thing that we actually used to do quite a lot was to go from Bogotá, we would get the car, we would fill it with stuff, and we would do the whole journey, which is about nine to 10 hours, give or take. It was a kind of famous thing to do because, so basically, once you leave Bogotá, there's actually a part that is known as the Devil's Nose, a rock that they weren't able to fully put down. So you just stay there and it looks like a nose, so yeah. But then you would go a little bit down. While the Bogotá is quite high, you will reach these areas known as Meligar and Girardot. Here the weather is way warmer, and it's not exactly far, far from Bogotá. So this is also a very famous place to just visit during holidays. But after that, you're in a low zone. You have to go up again, and you have to go throughout the Andes. It is a very <laughs> moving um, road, not for everyone. So you can do that by car and you would usually stop quite a lot because again, it's quite a few hours. Another thing that you could do is to basically go by bus. We would usually do the night one, so you would spend most of the time sleeping really. Once I remember the bus stopped and we were still high up in the mountain, so you could see and again, we would travel throughout the night, so we could not see much. But they stopped for so long that the sun rise up. And you could see like the mountain. It was a little bit scary, but I was also tired. So I remember being like, ooh, okay, back to sleep. <laughs> Priorities. And then you go once again down, and that's how you reach that. This time around, we did not do this. I took a plane. It's less than an hour. And lucky for me, it was a beautiful day. So I was able to take a lot of videos and pictures. It was so pretty. Now, let's say you reach it. Where can you visit? I already talked about La Merced, the church. And like I said, around that area, there's a lot of things. There is another church called La Ermita. It was actually built in the 17th century, but there was a earthquake in 1925, so it got destroyed. 
and then in the 40s they decided to rebuild it with a gothic style but it's kind of small so it's i don't know pocket size gothic church also there are some archaeological finds and a few parks here and there like the birds park and the simon bolivar there's also a few bridges that go through the river cali also in the area there is the calima gold museum and the theater enrique buenaventura that was built in the 20s and because it is of course a touristic area around the streets and all of it you can find a lot of things to try a lot of street foods but also restaurants as per usual with food be careful but also it's nice i mean people eat it a lot mainly focus of who goes if you see people from the place mostly eating there that's a nice sign there's a normal theater called the jorge Sachs. now this is an important part of colombian culture that i think we don't really talk about much now this dude was actually a writer he was caleño aka from cali and he wrote maria it is a novel that i would define in ao3 terms as hurt slight comfort but mainly hurt there's a lot of environment and there's a lot of drama yeah i mean it's not bad i read it a long time ago but basically it was quite famous for a lot of reasons and you can find it has been translated to many languages so if you're interested like which i recommend it yeah why not but one important thing is that yes there's a theater however he lived in a state an hacienda and he based a lot of the story on that place so you can actually visit it this is like an hour away from the center of the city and it's called hacienda el paraiso we visit that ages ago i do still have some photos and yeah it was really really nice especially if you're interested in architecture from like the 1800s and if just in general interested in that <laughs> i would recommend it it was very very nice also and you did not hear this from me but if you write jorge Sachs, maria película on this site you might be able to find the movie i don't think it is in any other language if not in spanish but if you do like a quick look i think you can get an idea of what it is about another famous place is el cerro de las tres cruces aka the peak of the three crosses so the story goes that long long ago at cartagena there was a lot going on and a priest was like i think i think there is a demon around the city so with the church they were like oh we found it and we need to expel it they were able to expel it from cartagena his name was pusiraco however he arrived to cali and he was at that peak and it was creating a lot of issues in 1837 there was a plague people were dying because of diseases of all sorts the production of food the, the agriculture was struggling there were a lot of incidents going on it wasn't cute so two priests were like we need to do something because this is obviously because of Pusiraco. he is doing this dirty so we need to do something and with the church they decided to you know what we're going to do we're going to create three crosses in guadua which is a type of wood similar to bamboo it's from the same family we're going to build those crosses and we're going to do a whole thing of walking around the city and we're going to place them at the peak the thing is though the idea originally was to make him go away the idea was that Pusiraco had to f up but what happened was that Pusiraco actually became trapped in that peak so the only thing they could do was that every year they would do the whole procession in which they would change the three classes this became kind of a normal thing to do however these two priests actually have to leave the city because of various reasons and people try to keep on doing this the people would try to keep on the tradition but after a while it was a little bit harder to maintain until 1925 which if you remember is when la ermita got destroyed because of an earthquake this earthquake actually destroyed a lot of the city and what happened at that point is that everyone was like he's getting out again that and fucker he's out so at this point they decided you know what i think we just should build the crosses in cement and just left them there and that's what they did so the story is that basically pusiracus is still there but he is imprisoned by these three crosses I mean, when they built them, there was also the centenary of that whole procession, and it was also like the 400th year anniversary of the city itself. So, yeah. Anyway, another beautiful city to visit is La Loma. La Loma means hill, and if you go up, then you can see quite a lot of the city. It's usually a place that you can strand on, and also a lot of people sell handcrafted stuff. And as per usual, there's a lot of places to eat, because one thing about us, we're gonna eat. 
it's a very nice if you want to you know spend like a chill day it is in the city still so you don't have to go far but again you have a nice view of the city now going back down again from there you reach the students park and here you can see a particular statue this is the statue of Jovita Feijó this is more of a Caleña story this is a story that is more connected with Cali aka I wouldn't say that people outside of Cali particularly know this story but I think it's beautiful Basically, Jovita was actually a real person and she was very particular. Her story is actually fascinating, I think. She helped also a lot of the students. So at her death, they basically built this statue and it mainly represents the beauty of being unapologetically yourself without fear of what others might think. I don't know, I think it's beautiful, so yeah. Another park, because we love parks, is El Parque del Perro. That's a statue of a dog, hence the name. Around, that's a very nice area, yeah, there's a lot of stores, there's also a lot of restaurants, so if you want to have a bite, even late at night, a typical thing to do is to go out, dance, and then go there to have a bite, which we did. It was very nice. Next, another place that is quite famous at Cali is the zoo. I have a weird relationship with zoos, but I cannot deny that it is a very important zoo, it is quite nice, and it has a lot of cool stuff. I used to be a huge fan of it when I was younger. Every time we could go, I would be like, yeah, we're going. I remember there was the night creatures and outside you have the sort of mold of the biggest bat of the world. So you would put yourself there and see if you could, you know, if it was bigger than you. I don't think I have grown much after that, but anyway. Then there was the whole glass castle where you have all of the butterflies. It is genuinely beautiful. However, one of my kind of issues is that sometimes I feel, I don't know, what we didn't visit this time and I don't know how much have they changed stuff. But some animals I feel they don't have much space, which is kind of a weird sensation to see them because I feel that, again, it, I don't know, it makes me feel claustrophobic. But that's your own judgment, so if you want to visit, you do you boo. Now, remember we said that there were bridges and there was the river Cali. So when you go up the river, there is a particular place which you can sort of call the beginning of the river boulevard. This is an area where there's a lot of things going on. One of the things that you can see there is a statue of a cat, El Gato del Rio. Basically, in 1996, in Colombian artists gifted the big cat to the city. They placed it there. Good job. Ten years later, the city wanting to embellish as much as they could, they decided to ask all the Colombian artists to create girlfriends for the cat. And each artist kind of paints around them in a particular way. Originally there were 15, however throughout the years many others have also created other statues. Which you can find not only down the boulevard but in other places. One of which we actually saw was one in a mall. And this is when I need to do a sort of parenthesis. And this is a cultural parenthesis. The malls are incredibly important in Colombian uh, culture and this is something I did not really realize until again I moved. Here in Europe you have malls, it's not that <laughs> they don't have them, but cities don't have that many. Usually stores are one place in like a road or just place around the city. Again you do have some but they're not that common. For example around me there are a few, but you need to drive or at least take the, you know, the train or something to reach there. Now, I do think that is because our cities are incredibly big and chaotic. And I think malls serve as sort of point of encounters. I remember growing up, everyone would live near a mall, so that could be a point of reference. I live near this mall. I live near this mall. So also if you would meet, you would go to a mall. It was kind of a great point and you could spend the, your day there. And I think also especially in Bogota, because sometimes it just rains whenever it wants to rain. At least you have a roof over you. And the reason why I'm saying this is not just because, you know, point blank, this is what we do. But because I think it would be a great recommendation. If you want to see a little bit more about the culture in terms of food, how kids play, what do they play, as well as the things that people buy, the things that people search for, and how they treat each other because again you go with your friends you go with your family all of that is an indication of how we live and all of that you can see at the mall in cali i would say that cat was in unicentro uh, but then you have i would say two of my favorite were also growing up chipichape and jardin plaza honestly so fun 
Oh, also, not that you care, but in one of the malls, I think it was at Rune Centro, there was a fabric store, because that's another thing that I also said with La Loma, that you can find a lot of handcrafted stuff. I don't know why, but we do a lot of handcraft stuff. I remember growing up, I did origami course, I did a Play-Doh course. We did a lot of stuff that were, you know, meant of like hand stuff. And this is something that I noticed with a relative of mine that lives in the UK. Like they also notice that Europeans are a bit more limited, like there are no courses and even just the materials can be hard to find. And if you find them, they usually don't, are not cheap, basically. They're still handcrafted things, of course there are. But I mean, how easy it is for you without like a relative that already does that. It's a little bit harder. But anyway, I got a beautiful fabric and I made a scar with that. Parenthesis of a parenthesis done. Back to the river cat, there you can find a lot of squares and people usually do activities there. Either courses or they just do like free stuff. Like people dancing and that sort of thing. There is a modern art museum of La Tertulia. And around that I remembered that they used to sell some empanadas. Empanadas out of that, depending on where you are in Latin America, they could be different. Us are made with a base of corn flour and it's filled with meat or chicken or veggies, all sorts of stuff. They're delicious, quite common street food. Also, there is a more recent monument that I had no idea about, known as Monumento a la Maceta. Macetas are something that actually they were in the movie Encanto. It's basically a basket with candy and stuff to play with that uncles and aunts would give to their nephews. The whole point of it is that it reinforces the connection. It is celebrated the 29th of June, and whenever we went during summer holidays, we would usually have one. Sometimes you can either go and pick it yourself, and of course your uncles and aunt pays, or there could be a full surprise. Now, Cali is actually also known as a sport city, and they have done quite a lot to keep that fame. Like I said, you have the sports centers where you can find the pool, and you can absolutely visit to just, you know, have a day off. But usually in there, you also have a lot of other activities. And people usually do a lot of activities. I recall growing up, of course, soccer, aka okay, football. Some of my cousins did cycling and hockey. And I think we did together for a while tennis, when I was not terrible at it. Kelly actually hosted the Pan American Games, both in 1971 and in 2013. And that absolutely not only consolidates that fame, but helps to create a city where you can just do sport quite easily. Cali, however, is known for a particular nickname, La Sucursal del Cielo. Directly translated as Branch of Heaven, Cali is basically a city that never sleeps. It genuinely, something is always happening all year round. There's a festival, there's a concert, there's always something going on. And it's fun and people are very nice. So yeah, I think they deserve that title. This is something that I already talked about in my San Andres video. The fact that we just add music whenever we can. And Cali's absolutely no different. You're gonna listen at the mall. Usually music is playing or there are events with music. If you take a cab or an Uber or whatever, they're usually gonna be listening to music. Ah, boy. Oh, boy. Uh -huh. So my relatives actually work, they are players and they sing and I was able to accompany them to two different gigs, one of which was at a restaurant and they were playing just fun music that usually everybody knows. <laughs> And then we visit a bar called Route 66 where they play more rock music. This is basically to say that you're going to hear all sorts of music and you're probably going to hear them all the time. There's however one genre of music that Cali has established himself as the place to listen and enjoy this music, which is salsa. Salsa was not originated in Colombia. Sometimes people have that misconception. It's not. But during the 80s, 
Cali started to become quite famous because of that. In particular, there was this Colombian group called Grupo Nietzsche, who made a song called Cali Pachanguero. And after that, it just, you know, kept on going, kept on going. And in 2002, Cali actually became the global capital city of salsa. There are so many courses. We actually were able to visit one. It was in this place called La Topa Tolonda. It was very, very fun. And after you have the course, then you go and have a little bit of a dance. And yeah, you have people that don't know at all, but you also have people that are very, very good. And there's really no expectation. The whole point is to have fun. I have some uh, European friends here that have taken courses. And it is so interesting to me when I see them because, and this is a tip if you have done courses and then you visit a Latin American country, we might dance different. Of course, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, that's the baseline. But we don't think too much. I don't know how to explain this. Like, yeah, you count, but after a certain point, you don't really count that much and you don't plan that much. You have to get, you honestly are improvising most of the time and also some steps might be slightly different and we might focus more for example on the hips so the people might focus more on the arms and turning and all of that i still think it's a beautiful experience if you want to there's probably going to be any course going on one main example thought of why cali is known as the branch of heaven it's la feria de cali from the 25th to the 30th of december it's party time I mean, it's usually always party time, but I mean, even bigger. The festival was created in 1958 after there was an explosion that, you know, hurt a lot of the city. So in order to lift off the mall, they decided to have this festival. And it just became an annual thing, and then it became bigger and bigger. And that is one of the most important things of the city and maybe the country. It is a very, very famous festival. And if you can visit during those days, whew, Cali it's so in love with salsa, they have a salsodromo. And during these days, it goes out of the window. You're gonna dance absolutely every single day. They also make a huge concert with a lot of famous artists. There are horse riding events and classic cars. There's also a beauty pageant. And in most reason, they have tried to add to this whole festival a moment to remember history, which I think is lovely. There's also usually a bullfighting event. This has been part of the festival for a while, and it is still in doubt whether they're gonna keep on doing it or if they're gonna full stop. Yeah, it's still not exactly clear. Now, personally, I think it's terrible. I visited once because of a relative and I think it is one of the worst things I've seen in my whole life. So I don't agree with that and I would like it to stop. But it is part of still because again, it's not exactly clear whether they're gonna keep on having it or not. And I think you should know that. Back to happier this course. As I mentioned a few things about food, this is something that I need to stop. This needs to be a whole chapter about it. Because of how my whole journey went through aka family time, some of this food was made at home. Some of it we found in restaurants and again as a street food. So this is going to be sort of a list of a combination of foods you can find. We talk about empanadas and we talk about the candy that we put in macetas, which is kind of marshmallows, lollipops, things like that. Interesting enough, I was actually talking with a relative on my visit to Colombia about how absolutely important food is when it comes to socialization. Like most, if not all activities that you do with other people somehow involve food. And by the way, I'm not mean just Colombian culture. I see it here in Italy as well. And I've seen that in many other cultures. Basically, if you can add food, probably people are going to add food. Not complaining, by the way. Good job, society. <laughs> because we don't have seasons, that basically means that when it comes to fruit and veggies, we have food all year round. Because of the dry and rainy season, some things might be a little bit harder to find. More or less, you're going to find fruit every single day of the year. Fruit plays a very important role in our lives. When you go to a supermarket, you're usually going to see these pyramids of fruit. And there's usually two ways to buy fruit. You either buy fruit to have as juice, because a typical lunch or dinner for us, even breakfast actually, you're usually going to have a glass of juice. But this is fruit juice that you make with fruit. Here in Europe, it's harder. Maybe the only juice that you can have from directly from fruit all year round might be orange juice. All of the others are dependent on the season and also you usually just buy 
the box of fruit juice. In Colombia, we just make the juice. And usually you do like a whole jar and it lasts like a couple of days. At the store, you can actually find the pieces of fruit for juice already picked up. And they are in this freezing bag, so you can put it in your freeze and just leave it there. Or one of the things that we used to do was to buy the fruit and you separate it. You do a part with juice, we used to do jam, and the other one would go into the freezer. Some of the fruits that you can have as juice are things like pineapple, feijoa, uchua, mango, guajaba, lulo, blackberries, you know, so many. And then you have fruit that you eat during your breakfast or as a dessert. Once again, things like mango, but also things like guanana, which is one of my favorite fruits ever. You can have that as juice, but I prefer it as, as it is. You can have watermelon, cantaloupe, papaya, banana, etc. One thing already, a plate of food would usually always contain protein. Like, don't be surprised if you see interesting combinations. And that's another thing that I did not notice how much we had until I moved out of the country. But let's do some examples. This is a typical breakfast. You're gonna have some eggs, some fruit, and some bread, and some flour-based bakes. I don't know how to call them. Baked goods? Like pastries? Anyway, they are known as almohanas or arepas. And usually for breakfast we also have chocolate, which is not hot cocoa. It's not. It's less dense, you can do it with water or with milk. Another thing that we might eat for breakfast is mazamorra. This is a corn-based porridge. It's not exactly soup, but it's not exactly porridge either, but it might be closer to porridge. And it has milk, and usually it's warmed up, and you put over sugarcane syrup. I think it's delicious. For lunch and dinner, you usually can have something dry that we call seco. So you have either rice or potatoes, or both, usually both. Is that healthy? No really. But it is delicious, so... A typical thing from Cali are marranitas. With the plush and when it is green, you can do all sorts of snacks. One of which is you plaster over, then you open it a little bit, creating this sort of space, and inside that space we put pork belly. Or you can have the arepas that we already saw, and you put over a piece of meat. Or you can have the platen chip separated and the fried pork on its own. And that type of fried pork we call chicharron. Now, arepas and chicharron and these things would be more like side dishes. Usually the main plane is a piece of meat and, again, rice and potatoes and some veggies. But you can, you know, snack with all of those. Another thing that you can see as side dish are chorizo, chunchullo and morcilla. Here's where a lot of non-Latino people might be a little bit lost. Because, let's be honest, it is intestines and it might not look or sound appetizing, but let me tell you, it is delicious. Some people have called morcilla black pudding, but I must say it right away, no. <laughs> and the reason why I say this is, I have never tried black pudding, but I have seen it. And I think the main point is that the way we do the rice and the way we do the veggies and the way we put everything together, each culture does all of those steps in different ways and the mayus is slightly different stuff. The rice that you find here in Italy, for example, usually is different from the one you find usually in Colombia. So even though you do the rice in the same way, the outcome might be different, as well as the spices and things like that. Sometimes doing a comparison, my either if you like that thing, you might have high hopes, and if you don't like it, you might not even want to try it. So that might be a limitation. In the case of Marseille, it's basically the intestine and has rice and veggies inside. I love it. I think it's delicious <laughs> and I recommend it. But again, I understand that alongside the other things, they might sometimes not sound appetizing. Having done the salt, let's go to the dessert. And a typical dessert might be just the fruit. Some fruits are just so sweet that they are a sweet snack on its own. But sometimes we like to spice up the fruit for example, the platen, when it is ripe, like dark basically, that's when it is sweet. So you can just squish it and fry it. You can just cook it as it is and then you open it and have it like that. Or you can add cheese and bocadillo. And when you do that with cheese and bocadillo and then you fry it, that's an aborraja. 
which is also delicious. Another thing is champus, this is very typical from Cali. It is made with lulo and corn and some pineapple. The best way I could describe it, it's the Cali version of bubble tea, mainly because you have the corn that you can feel it, but it's not chewy like bubble tea and it doesn't splash either. I love it, it's delicious. The exact recipe can vary because depending on who is doing it, but overall, I love it. There's also another thing that this is a very typical street food. You are given a cup with all sorts of fruits. Then you are given condensed milk over and sometimes a biscuit and that's a cholao. You can decide which fruit do you want. If you're not picky, you can just be like all of them or you can tell them leave out this or add more of this thing. But it is delicious also because it has ice. So for the heat, great. There is another snack that I was actually looking for, but I wasn't certain I could find it, which is sugar cane. Once upon a time, okay, when I was younger, we would go to the outskirts of the city and there you would find people just selling them. I don't know if people still do that because we were not able to visit, but I believe you could find at least one. Or one thing that they have is a machine called trapiche. This is a machine that you put the cane and you rotate it and it squishes the cane and that brings out the juice. The juice can be called guarapo, but some people actually may call it a slightly different because for some people guarapo it's when that juice has been also fermented a little bit. Like if you have it straight up, it doesn't have any alcohol. Usually also put a little bit of lemon. So like that is delicious. But for some people when you say guarapo, they expect that to be a little bit fermented. In any case, if you are able to taste it, I highly recommend it. So we were actually lucky enough to, at the center of the city, we were walking around, we found a girlie and she had it. So she gave us a juice, delicious, but she also saw me and she was a little bit surprised by it, which I think is why people haven't done this quite a lot recently. She saw me just a sugar cane. Because one of the things that we used to do when I was younger is that we would take the whole cane, we would bring it home, and then we would usually ask the guard of the area, basically, to use his big knife to cut it. Because when you cut it, you inside have the fibers that are filled with the juice. I was actually able to just, with a knife, do the whole thing. And it was delicious. I was so, so happy because it, that's something that I really, really wanted to do because I wanted to show it to you. You cut it also, of course, with a lot of care. You cut the pieces and you just chew them. If you take a small pieces, you can swallow them, but after a certain point, the fibers are quite strong, so you need to spit them out. I was very, very happy. Another thing you can find that it's even in a mall, it's mango biche. When the mango is green, they cut it in this sort of noodle-like shape. And you can, and usually it's with salt and pepper. I used to have it with lemon and honey. They usually have all the things, so you can choose what you want to add. And it's a delicious snack. If you're uncertain about buying on the streets, or if you're like, well, I don't know, I'm not sure about what I want, if you go to any supermarket, you also can find a lot of typical food. Starting with the fruit, again, we have the salpicon. It's basically cut of fruit that you put in a vase with usually a soda, and you just have it like that. It's also very refreshing, especially when you're hot. Or you can go to the sweet aisle, and then you can find things like manjar blanco. I think I talked about it in my video about Colombian food that I brought with me. But anyway, manjar blanco, it's a sweet, creamy stuff. Another version of it, which is a little bit more processed, it's arequipe. You can have it on your own, or you can have it with other snacks. For example, arequipe, you can put it over a pastry known as miloja. Those are great for tea time. There's also Dunkin' Donuts, uh, which you cannot find here in Italy, so that's why I kind of went a couple of times. They have very nice pastries, what can I say? But there's also a store called Mimos, which makes ice cream, and it's a very generic store, to be honest. It's just ice cream, nothing special. But I recommend that, so you know, if you want to try something sweet or you want ice cream or something, that could be a nice place to go, and you can usually find it, both at the mall, but also stores around the city. Like, I get it, you don't always want to just try stuff that are that you've never tried before. Oh, as an extra thing, when we were at the mall, I remember, they were selling grosellas. Grosellas are 
10 lemons into this tiny thing and they're green, beautiful color and you usually put salt over them they're very nice I don't know how to explain the taste it's not for everyone <laughs> but yeah, it's a nice try this city holds a very special place in my heart it saw me throughout my different eras when I was a teenager with hopes for the future during my emo time I was in a 25 degree weather wearing jeans and long sleeves I think I actually first dyed my hair there. It wasn't nothing fancy, but I, I do recall doing it for, I think it was a Christmas party. A lot of memories uh, that are very dear to my heart happen in that city. And I think it's a fascinating city, again, because of the history and because of the culture. And I think it is a great example of Colombian beauty. From food to music to just the people. They're very beautiful people. They're so warm and... Again, ready to party. <laughs> so if you have the chance, I would highly recommend you to visit. If you would like to, which places would you like to visit? Maybe have you heard of something that I didn't talk about? Or maybe if you have visited, what did you saw? What did you like? In any case, this video is long enough and that last part with the food kind of made me hungry. So I'm gonna go. Bye.